So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tura Vastran from the Center for the Study of Global Human Movement. And um, it's a pleasure to welcome you at our center. And joining us today will be Dr. Albina Azmonova, reader of political and social thought at the University of Kent and author of the book, Capitalism on Edge. Equally joining will be Professor James Galbraith, a member of King's College and a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, as well as Marshall Auerbach, research associate for the Levy Institute at Bard College, a financial markets practitioner, and a member of the Independent Media Institute. And you should have all received two chapters from the book, so you had a chance to get into it. And I hope uh, you will consider also buying the book because definitely it is worth the read about um, well, global capitalism these days. Um, so I will just hand over here to Albina, or who will tell us a little bit more about her book. Thank you. Well, very uh, pleased to be doing this. Um, and thank you for hosting me. Now, this a relatively uh, thin book uh, offers a num uh, uh, an answer to a number of puzzling developments in contemporary Western societies. Each of the past three decades has given us to ponder one bizarre phenomenon. In the 1990s, a surprising upsurge began of anti-immigrant sentiment in Western democracies. Right-wing populism gained popularity while it was expressing itself openly with xenophobia, with anti-immigrant sentiments. This was part of an anti-establishment insurgency. Now, the surprising thing about this was that it was happening in conditions of good economic growth and low unemployment. The 1990s were the most prosperous decade our societies had ever known. The second bizarre occurrence took place in the first decade of our century. It, it, it was not the financial, it was the way societies react to the financial movement. Now the 2008 financial crash um, created terrible economic turmoil and even a social crisis through bankruptcies and unemployment. Yet capitalism, and, and capitalism was pronounced to be on its deathbed or at least in profound crisis. Yet societal protest was rather timid with the exception of some street protests and calls for diminishing economic inequalities. Our societies took the blow with strange equanimity. The coronavirus pandemic is the third bizarre phenomenon. The strange thing about this is the following. Western societies have never been so affluent or scientifically advanced. We have created spacecraft able to cross the outer boundaries of the heliosphere and, and go into interstellar space. We collect organic molecules from Saturn's moons and have sequence the DNA of a woman who lived 13,000 years ago. And yet these same <clears throat> scientifically savvy and affluent society are having a hard time to cope with the spread of a virus that was neither completely uh, unknown nor too deadly. So <clears throat> my book offers an answer to such I claim that at the root of these bizarre developments, the massive destabilization of societies, which affect not only what Guy, uh, Guy uh, Standing, the, the British sociologist, has called the precariat or the losers of globalization, but also the winner, the affluent, highly skilled, well employed, those whose lives are envied in stories about uh, the rise of inequality. Our societies have become so exposed to the pressures of the competitive production of profit that defines capitalism, that we are faced with the phenomenon of what I describe as the massification of precarity. Hardly anyone is spared or sheltered. Now, in 
at least in the story I give, uh, it all began with one seemingly trivial and not so much commented policy shift that happened sometime around the very end of the 20th century. So we all know how in the 1980s, neoliberalism began, uh, you know, was launched, the center left and the right government in Western society embarked on what became known as the neoliberal globalization. They used their technological advantage to engineer the integration of the global economy through free trade agreements. The catchword of that policy formula was competition. But as these governments started to navigate the waters of the globally integrated capitalism they had created, Western governments' greatest concern came to ensure their competitiveness in the global market. And this is not a minor matter, this shift from competition to competitiveness. The first time I noticed it, um, this shift was in the so-called Lisbon agenda of the European Union that pledged to make the, the European uh, economy the most competitive uh, uh, bloc uh, in, uh, by, by 2020. Because in order to secure the competitiveness of national economies, um, you know, in, the, in, in putting this as, as, as the top priority, they started doing things like supporting a handful of specific companies which already had a competitive advantage. So kind of to, to support specific capitalists rather than capitalism um, because of the competitive advantage these companies had in the global economy. Increased competition with countries with cheap labor force who are also catching up fast uh, with the digital revolution. I have in mind China. Uh, imposed, but not only China, uh, the, those were the rules of the game, um, imposed impose further reforms of labor market and the slash. As a result, globalization did not just create a conflict between winners and losers, it created massive uncertainty for both the winners and the losers. So, you know, put it in a nutshell, I claim that precarity, and I understand this as this massive destabilization of, of, of our life world is what ails the 99%. This is the grave social question of our times. So while we have been fussing about the crisis of capitalism, neoliberal capitalism had transformed itself, had morphed into a new form, what I describe as precarious capitalism, driven by policies aiming to navigate the new economy of open borders and IT innovation. The political economy of insecurity had in general precarious experiences of security on, on two levels. On personal level, through um, things such perceived or anticipated or real uh, job loss and um, kind of pressures for more and more performance on, on, on your job. So on personal level, but also on societal level, as public services uh, have been downsized. Individual precarity is at the root of the upsurge of anti-immigrant sentiment. The more general societal precarity is at the root of the health emergencies crisis because our societies are no longer equipped to cope with such a great uh, loss. So if we accept this verdict about the massification of precarity being the social question of our time, this diagnosis has important implications about the prognosis, about our strategies. There is good news and bad news. The bad news first, uh, it is that in context of instability, of, of radical instability, people become more conservative, even reactionary, as we have seen with the absurd of the far right. This is the case, especially when there is no positive utopia, such as social, was the socialism in the uh, late 19th century, to propose a positive alternative. And socialism, well, we have to face it, even as it is gaining popularity among the young generation, it has lost much of its pull, much of its appeal. 
because of the negative experience with Eastern Europe. So it cannot serve us as a positive ideal. Instability without available utopia nurtures conservative attitudes. Thus, the popularities of, of ideas such as uh, you know, sovereignty, community, uh, and, and drawn to their extremes of fear and hatred of strangers. Now the good news. The good news is that for the first time in the history of the broad spectrum of groups is affected negatively by the core dynamics of capitalism, the competitive production of profit. This gives us an opportunity to forge a very wide alliance in favor of radical change without the help of a utopia, without a deep or terminal crisis of capitalism, and without a revolutionary break. But to be able to seize that opportunity that we have now for a kind of a paradigm shift in, in policy, in thinking, in imagining in the future, we need to bust the three great political myths of the left, the right, and the center. Namely that inequality is the problem and you can fix that problem with redistribution and, and, and fiddling with worker participation in, in, in enterprises. Second, that free markets generate wealth and that community is a safe haven. So these are the general contours of my argument. Uh, there's plenty of interesting detail. I have uh, um, something to say about um, the great contradictions of capitalism. I'm not going to go into this now. Um, so let me stop here uh, and, and, and move on to my colleagues. Thanks, Albina. Um... James, do you want to take on from here? I'd be happy to. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Very pleased to be uh, back in Cambridge, and at least in some um, you know ephemeral sense. Um, and also, uh, you know, this is a, one of these rare occasions that doesn't happen very often, at least to me, when I really feel like I'm, I, I caught the wave. Uh, because it was, uh, you know, it was my pleasure to be, I think, the first person to publish a review of uh, capitalism on edge. Uh, and I was prompted to do so in the spirit of something uh, that John Steinbeck said to my father in the 1950s, which was, they don't have the courage to give you uh, unqualified praise, then I say to hell with them. Uh, and, and this book was one of the rare ones that we really could rise to that. Uh, that standard and, and you know, just go all out and say, this is a, this is a marvelous book. What is its, um, its value? I mean, to me anyway, one of the great things about it is that it provides a framework for thinking uh, effectively about social economic reality. It's not a book that's a mass of facts and gives you historical evidence on this and that. You really just get what it gives you primarily is a, is a conceptual uh, a structure uh, on which you begin to hang a, a body of coherent thought about, about the condition we're in and, and, and what we have to do. Um, and the particular um, aspect of this, which, I, which, which grabbed me from the beginning and I think sort of provides the, the Ariadne's thread here is the way in which uh, Albana uh, sort of conceptualizes the evolution of the capitalist system uh, from the period of, of, of laissez-faire and then of classical and neoclassical economics, which basically collapsed in the 1990s, although it didn't, in another century went by and it hasn't realized it, um, and uh, to the rise of, of, the, of, the, of the successor routine, um, uh, which were welfare state capitalism uh, in the New Deal in, in the United States and in the post-war reconstruction in Europe. And then the erosion uh, of welfare state through the neoliberal uh, counter-revolution, which was in the early 1980s. Now, and that's all familiar territory if you think about it clearly, but it's something in which a, you know, a body of opinion has largely gotten stuck. Uh, and what Albania has done is given us the, the successor a phenomenon in a clear-cut way, which is the uh, the defining characteristic of uh, of the current age, which is insecurity, precarity, uh, and the way in which that affects social and economic relations. 
Now that neoliberal framing in which basically spans you know, the career of an economist like myself, uh, I, I was raised obviously in the prior tradition and have been out of sorts since I, you know, since I was a graduate student at Cambridge. I mean, it was the last uh, bulwark of the pre-neoliberal era. Um, but it has spawned a progressive, so-called progressive response, which is encapsulated in a rhetoric of uh, inclusion, opportunity, growth, and as Albina emphasizes, insists on inequality, inequality across persons, across households, uh, as uh, the as a dominating social question. I've worked on inequality for many decades. It's never been my intent to turn it into the central moral issue as my, my focus has been on measuring and understanding what the patterns mean. In any event, there is this uh, this body of, 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 of thought, which is now, I think, a very well established current in what passes for the dominant progressive thinking in, the, in certainly in the United States, I think in Europe as well, and become a respectable node of things like concepts like inclusivity and so on and I'll, I'll go with it and you can think for example the, the fact that the, the the ceo of the eponymously named washington center for uh, for inclusive growth uh, for equitable growth has just become a member of the president's council and future president's council of economic advisors because it kind of captures the way in which this thinking has uh, has has come uh, gravitated toward the center of what is a respectable uh, political thinking. Now, what um, Albana has done is challenge this in, I think, two very distinct and important ways. First of all, she argues against the transformative potential of crises, um, uh, which were, in fact, um, you know, in practice, they 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 served actually to. Uh, um, to facilitate the transition to the neoliberal mode. And when I also just described in a different in a book a dozen years ago as the predator state, in which you got the, the politics of erosion of, of the welfare state institutions and privatization and enrichment out of state structures that were otherwise quite robust. Um, anyway, the, the notion that many people have that you can get a crisis that will that will give you a transformative politics is the opposite of the of, of the reality. The crises have not only created the neoliberal uh, uh, vision, but also have transformed it into the into the current state of precarity capitalism over time. Uh, and precarity keeps people under control. It keeps them focused on their personal precarity in this context of individualism. Keeps people focused on soul. On their on their on their problems and how to how to maintain it themselves in some state of balance and uh, in an increasingly difficult environment. Um, now, so there are two I got two more points, and then I'll subsign. There, there are two historical periods that really drive this home. Uh, one of them is uh, this is the 1960s. The 1960s were a period of social rebellion, uh, but. Uh, it was at the moment of the greatest uh, strength of the welfare state and the most egalitarian period in the history of the industrial West. Uh, and this is not accidental. It was precisely because it was this case that, uh, that uh, you know, the youth of my generation and the slightly earlier uh, f uh, had the, um, uh, you know, the security and the capacity uh, to rebel against aspects of the system that they found um, distasteful. Um, so, uh, so the other and the other period, uh, interestingly enough, was this past summer in the United States, uh, and when you had a, the country was racked by social protests uh, that spread very rapidly around the country, uh, and in the middle of the pandemic, no one has to ask why. And was it was because people were terrified by the coronavirus? No. On the contrary, it was because in the reaction to the, or at least in part facilitated by the fact that in reaction to the coronavirus, a great many people were freed from the obligations of going to work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and given an, uh, a, a very substantial benefit, which was actually a raise for about 30% of the workforce who received it, the unemployment compensation insurance of $600 a week. It's not small change for, the, for, for, for service workers in America. And as a result, in some degree, and I mean, uh, again, not as a result, but this is certainly a factor in the way in which political energies were liberated over that period. And of course, as the situation developed and the money began to run out, people's savings, which spiked in April, were running down over the summer and fall, and political energy was also not unpredictably declined. So I think you can see an association that in both of these instances between relative security and, and, and political uh, 
and the potential for political change and between insecurity and precarity uh, and in, in uh, structures of, of, of control. So this is a very important, I think, and fundamental point to get, to get across to people and to understand as part of the politics. Um, in terms of the, just to add a couple of thoughts, as uh, Albana mentioned, the effect of the coronavirus in the West, why is it different? Uh, why is it, why was there a, such a solidaristic response in, um, in China, Vietnam, Korea, Singapore, and other places, and not in Europe or the United States? I think this is, has everything to do with, this, with, with the underlying structures of precarity, which have built up in the globalization of the world and the, the division of labor in the world border. Uh, what our Western, leading Western societies, particularly the UK and the US do in the world is export advanced capital goods for which the markets have collapsed and provide employment by, uh, by well, what are relatively low wage service uh, activities, uh, which are, are, are the activities of a very high uh, income, very prosperous societies, uh, basically keeping, each, keeping themselves and each other entertained. Uh, but of course, not essential to uh, economic or social life in a crisis, and so you have uh, a kind of a, a, a kind of particular uh, structure that is extremely fragile and vulnerable. Whereas what happened in Asia was a, built happened to societies that were in the center of the of the economic structure and had adaptable manufacturing and other capacities and were able to not only meet their material needs, but also to mobilize in a very effective way to quell the virus, which is what they succeeded to doing and to a very large extent in China, Korea, Vietnam, and some other places. Um, and uh, I guess the only point of disagreement I, I have with Albana comes uh, toward the end of her comments. She said, the good news is, I say good news, is there good news? I don't think there is good news, uh, but I'm willing to be persuaded on the point. So I'll yield to Marshall, who is an inveterate optimist and uh, <laughs> let him take over. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, I have to say that your concluding lines um, really, um, comports with what I thought. I, 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 uh, That's why I came in before you, Marshall. Because I, you know. <laughs> the 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 uh, the issue. I um, I mean, I, I have to say first of all that this was a, a, a stunningly good book and and, and really uh, uh, allowed me to rethink the uh, issues in a very very different way, and um, it, as a result, probably made me more uh, uh, um, pessimistic uh, rather than, than optimistic. Um, I shared many of the biases of, uh, you know, I, I, I have spent a lot of time criticizing so-called neoliberalism or neoliberal capitalism. And um, I used to think of this largely in terms of, uh, of inequality. And one of the things that the book um, highlighted to me is that um, that's really the wrong way to look at it. Uh, inequality is a symptom of a, the broader problem that um, Albana discusses, it, namely that it, it, it's a symptom of the economic precarity. Uh, it's not the cause. And so I think that if, if you tackle it, this from the point of view of, of, of inequality, um, you will get things like we're now getting on this by, from the so-called um, progressives in the United States where um, you get solutions, solutions in quote, quotation marks, such as um, you know, universal basic incomes, um, which uh, are effectively redistribution programs from uh, the, the winners to the losers. But, but they, they <clears throat> excuse me, they, they broadly represent placebo forms of, re of reform because they don't deal with the underlying pathologies that, that gave you the winners and the losers in the first place, um, which is why, for example, that um, you know, the, it's, the UBI is something uh, that's been taken up by um, Silicon Valley oligarchs. They love it because uh, it means they can just go on um, continuing with the existing system, making um, profits as much as possible. And, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you throw a few more scraps down to the, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to the downtrodden, to the precariat. Um, it, it's, it begins to resemble something out of um, H.G. Wells' the, the Time Machine, where you've got these celestial Eloi in them, uh, enjoying their um, heavenly paradise, and they they throw a few more scraps down to the caves where the Morlocks exist, and and we're getting closer to that kind of vision. Now, back in in two thousand eight, when we had the um, the financial crisis, um, and I, th I I naively thought that maybe this will be the the kind of um, um, event that will 
in gender change. And, and uh, I wasn't completely naive, I guess, because I've, I've spent a lot of my um, uh, life of studying FDR and the New Deal. And uh, he was able to use uh, that period to um, a, a time in which the so-called economic royalists were dislodged from power and, and, and real progressive reforms were introduced that, that fundamentally changed the, uh, the structure of, of capitalism. I mean, we, we went, the New Deal was not a return to the status quo ante. It, it, it created uh, uh, significant structural changes uh, and, and, and lasted uh, in, a, in, a, in a very profound, well, that lasted in a very profound way for, um, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and that didn't happen. In fact, uh, the, 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 the predators who, who caused the problems um, actually were the largest uh, beneficiaries. And um, I think um, this goes to a point that, that um, uh, Jamie has identified as well in his, one of his earlier books, Pred uh, The Predator State. And, and, and this is a problem I think the, the, the left has yet to really come to grips with, which is that um, if your government itself becomes a, a, an agent of, of predation, corporate or, or otherwise, um, how do you expect it to uh, affect um, change uh, to make uh, countries or economies um, less pro prone to precarity or inequality. So I thought, uh, well, maybe it wasn't bad enough and that um, <clears throat> the next crisis that we have will be the big one. And that will actually induce the, uh, the changes along the lines of what we had in the 1930s. But unfortunately, I didn't anticipate that the next uh, uh, crisis would be a, a pandemic, um, which actually um, has left all of the major players in place. And it happened at a time cruelly when you had the ultimate corporate predator in power in the United States. Um, and, and in fact, again, it has exacerbated the, 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 the problems of, uh, that, that have been described by uh, Albena, uh, not just inequality, but, but general economic precarity. In fact, it, would, it, it has expanded it because it's not just um, uh, people at the bottom end of the economic ladder that have been affected by this. And, and that was the other thing about the book that, that really struck me is that this is starting to extend into um, uh, what I would describe as um, traditional white collar professions. Um, it, it's, it's not simply a case that, you know, um, uh, the, the, the so-called lumpen proletariat are, are, are suffering the, the, the problems here. Um, it is extending into many uh, service professions. And um, I expect that um, as we um, continue the, and accelerate this, this global, as globalization continues um, and the globalization of, uh, of um, labor arbitrage continues, um, that's going to continue to adversely uh, impinge on um, uh, countries in, in Western Europe, in Europe and, and, and uh, North America. Um, I think as Jamie has pointed out, it's, it's less of a problem in, in East Asia where I lived for nine years uh, for a variety of reasons. One is, um, um, uh, as was pointed out, that um, uh, those countries have become the beneficiaries of this, um, of this outsourcing of labor. Um, they have uh, been improving their, their lives. They've been, they, they, as this uh, global arbitrage of labor has continued, it's benefited countries like um, China, South Korea, Vietnam, et cetera. And um, countries in, in Europe and the United States have, have, have become more prone to um, economic fragility and, and, and precarity. Um, so I think that that's a, a, a real problem. And um, so I guess where I come down on this is that um, I'm not really sure at this stage um, how this problem gets resolved. Um, ironically, um, both parties, uh, on both movements on the left and the right seem to, in, in one sense, instinctively grasp the, that um, uh, this goes beyond inequality. Um, and in the last election in the United States, there was uh, much discussion about um, uh, economic fragility, insecurity, and promises to restore that. Um, the two par parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, look at this in different ways. The Republicans uh, seem to think that you, they, 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 they seem to think that if you somehow staunch the flow of immigration, restrict the labor market, um, um, increase uh, military spending, um, give people their guns that, that somehow uh, will um, enhance their sense of security. So they, they, they approach it from a, from a, a cultural perspective. Um, Democrats, um, I think, recognize that it's, it, there, there are problems beyond that. But as I said earlier, their problem is that um, they look at palliatives which um, uh, address uh, some of the underlying symptoms uh, described in Albana's book, but they don't really um, have the, the the guts or the nerve to uh, tackle the 
structural problems because uh, they too are dominated by those um, very um, uh, classes, donor classes, which benefits uh, substantially from the, uh, the current uh, status quo. So, um, and I think this is also a problem in Europe. Um, I think uh, Brexit is a, is a symptom of that. Um, but I also think that um, uh, the European Union, even without Britain, is going to face a similar kinds of challenges. Um, neither uh, parties of the left or nor the right uh, seem to be in a position to offer uh, solutions here. So um, we're getting um, manifestations of more extreme movements on both sides of the uh, uh, the aisle, largely on the right, I would say, in 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 Europe. And and I and I, I don't think that um, you know, say, Marine Le Pen has has got an, an answer for what ails the people of France, but. I note that she still, you know, retains substantial support, um, as do a number of right-wing nationalist parties in other countries. So that's going to be the the, the challenge, and I really don't know how we um, address uh, or escape from this problem. Um, uh, the 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 paradox, as as Jamie pointed out, was that the last time we had these kinds of protests, we had a substantially more robust social welfare state, more economic security um, across. Uh, all classes, uh, which gave people the, um, the the chance to protest and 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 force more change. Well, that's that's precisely the kind of thing that um, the people that are currently running these countries don't want to see happen. And um, so, I, I think they're going to do all in their power to um, uh, throw a, a few scraps uh, to the masses, but otherwise um, uh, distract us through um, you know gladiatorial uh, combat, for example. In the, uh, I, it's interesting to me that in the United States, for example, um, there's been more emphasis placed on, on restarting um, sports leagues like the National Football League or baseball than there has been in addressing uh, uh, desperately needed help for those whose benefits are have run out, um, ran out in the summer and the, the rest of which will run out uh, by the end of the year. Uh, this is an enormous failure of leadership and yet there is no real response to this because um, ironically, as you um, exacerbate the economic precarity, people <clears> as <throat> point out, turn in on themselves, they can't collectively mobilize and it uh, you get a classic case of divide and rule. And that seems to be what's happening uh, in, in, in Europe as well. So um, on that pessimistic note, I will um, leave it and, and pass it back to, um, to Albena. Okay. Um... Shall I explain then why I feel so optimistic or shall we open for questions? I see we have about 20 minutes. Albina, go ahead and, and, and maybe just, uh, yeah, give your point of view. I think there's Here's already that. a good debate out there. And, and in between, what we will just do is we'll just collect over the chat box, whoever wants to contribute to the discussion and just give a sign over the chat box and we'll just call you in during the discussion, during the debate. Okay, uh, so why, uh, why, I, I, where I see uh, hope, or, you know, reasons for hope? Um, what has happened so far is making it clear that we have to abandon the equality within prosperity formula that has been dominant on the, you know, the center and on the left. Um, and, and, and replace quality and prosperity with uh, ability within well-being. What I'm saying that is that even in uh, the um, new green deal, the green new deal, there are still promises about unprecedented prosperity. But what is becoming clear is that we cannot satisfy the social justice agenda in this way. So we, the pandemic and the previous crisis, what they have made it clear, well, the, the heightened concerns with the environment is that prosperity should no longer be um, the direction in which we're taking politics. But they have also revealed an alternative, and this is kind of the stabilization of lives, working less, living with less. Uh, so we have a plausible alternative to poverty. Uh, and our societies are sufficiently prosperous uh, to provide for that well-being. 
I think that the American election also showed us that there is something positive going on there. It's, I think it's the first time both the center left and the center right, the Democrats and the Republicans, are uh, courting the workers. So doesn't that signal a change of, of direction within both parties, that within both the, big, the two big political families are starting to pay more um, attention to the concerns of the working people? Uh, that would, for me, would be a positive um, direction that opens the room for exactly the type of politics of stabilization that we need in order then to create the, the conditions for thinking big. We, everybody needs to feel more stable in order to think, you know, to create a culture of solidarity because currently we don't have a culture of solidarity and my experience with communism uh, make, has made me believe that egalitarianism is not the same as, as solidaristic society. So uh, equal societies can be also um, very poor of, of, of social capital. So this is uh, more or less uh, how I, I, I see where the hope lies, is that even the elites create an interest in changing, you know, replacing affluence with well-being and start to pay more attention to the grievances of the working population in its wide spectrum of um, experiences of grievances. Of course, that, that would very much depend on where the main uh, political forces are taking the discourse and we are at the crossroad. I see a lot of positive things actually happening in Europe. Um, the, the European Green Deal um, is being, you know, really pushed through. Uh, actually, the, 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 the reaction of both workers and employers, you know, there, is, there, is a, there are forces both from um, works in employees because they're scared of, of job loss. So the European Commission is pushing through uh, these things. So there is some a very strong political will uh, to go in this direction. For me, this is good news. Thank you, Albina. I see uh, we have an, a question from Becky. Becky, do you want to pose it yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Becky Slack. I'm a student at Professor Asma Nathan's actually in Brussels. Um, and um, I would, uh, Marshall, you kind of, you've kind of answered it. I don't know whether you've made my question redundant because you said that you're not sure how to resolve the problem of precarity. But I was interested to know what the panelists think are some very real, tangible, practical policies that governments should propose so that they can communicate with voters. Um, that will help tackle this issue of, um, of precarity? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, in an ideal world, I would like to see some sort of reconstruction of the, if it was possible, the old, uh, what, what, what used to be derided as tripartism. Um, uh, uh, Jamie's father was a, was a big advocate of this. In other words, I, I think some of the, uh, um, the focus on, uh, that, that you're seeing, in, particularly in the US right now, of um, going after big tech on the grounds of anti-monopolization is just um, um, a, a solution in search for a, 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 the wrong kind of problem. That They are um, saying, let's just um, go back and being a market economy again, and and um, somehow that's going to solve the problem. That's that's process. I, I would like to see, um, I have no problem with larger corporations, but I think you need um, countervailing um, uh, uh, forces on the other side. So. Um, I would like to see the government take a much more active role in formulating national industrial policy. Um, I think that is more feasible now in the context of the pandemic. I, I, what, you know, for all of uh, the sins of uh, Donald Trump's presidency, I think Operation Warp Speed and um, uh, government contributions in uh, the, the, for funding um, the um, vaccines for the pandemic, for example, it's, it's been done in an extraordinary length of time. And I think that should get us away from this idea that you just have a government that uh, operates as a neutral umpire and ensures um, efficient rent-free uh, markets. It, it can take a much more active role in formulating national industrial policy. Um, and I think at the same time, um, I would like to see us uh, embrace uh, some structures, changes in industrial structures that would um, um, enhance the position of labor. The, the problem, particularly in the United States, is that um, 
the the unionization is virtually dead. I think in the private sector, it comprises about nine percent of the workforce. So you'd have to find some sort of alternative um, uh, structure um, to enhance their power. Um, work councils, um, German-style co-determinism. Um, if we had, uh, I mean, Germany, uh, fortunately, even though it started to go down this road of uh, uh, of you know um, deconstructing everything that's good about its economy, um, uh, but I think we, uh, we we should look at the old uh, German uh, social market economy as a model, or some of the old Scandinavian model uh, uh, economies. Um, Jamie would also point out that you've got uh, something similar already ha happening in, in uh, places like uh, China or South Co Korea. Um, w what you want to do is have a, an active uh, state uh, and an active role for, for labor to offset the power of capital. And I think mm -hmm. if you can do that, um, uh, then um, uh, you can um, see some progress. Uh, I, I agree with Albana's point that it was good to see that um, you know, Republicans as well as Democrats are courting the, the working class vote. Um, I don't know how genuine that is. Um, ironically, um, if we get uh, uh, more focus on national security concerns, um, you know, in the United States, um, in respect of, of, of China, for example, I don't think it's, I personally don't think that's, uh, that's good policy. But if you, if you get, uh, the one good thing I will say about Cold Wars uh, is that they, they, uh, the, the, the pathological pursuit of profitability above every other instance it tends to get subsumed into broader um, programs of national mobilization, national security, whatever it is. So if that's what it takes um, um, to get us um, to a point where you're focusing on getting good quality jobs for a, a larger number of uh, working class families, then um, I would at least like to see a buy uh, the, to, to see uh, that happen. Let, let, let me jump in on this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. As I see the problem really in, in, in very markedly different terms. Uh, what is the problem of precarity? Uh, it is uh, a problem of security in old age, security in health, security in housing, all of which are vastly aggravated by the pandemic. Uh, what we have, uh, what we had was in the United States was compared to Europe, compared to much of the world, remarkably successful recovery, so to speak, uh, following the financial crisis and unemployment rate went down below 4%, was there for quite a while. Uh, and what were those jobs? They were all a very ephemeral kind of service jobs uh, in small, medium-sized uh, establishments. Uh, and they, they, they've evaporated by the tens of millions. Uh, people, however, had those jobs, they still have rent contracts, they still have mortgage contracts, mortgages to pay. Americans live in houses by and large, not apartments. Um, they can retreat into those houses, but they can't stay in them if they can't pay the bills. Uh, and, they, and then of course you have the problem of, of, of people losing their health insurance and some of that's covered by co various extensions to employer provided health insurance. But you know, a lot of it isn't. Uh, so you have people who are in uh, exaggerated states of, of precarity. And so first one thing one needs to do is to deal with that problem. I mean, if, if obviously the, the, the whole structure of the health system has been compromised uh, and I could go on on this, but you know, it's part of the problem is that hospitals can't make any money because people are actually not getting sick for their usual reasons. They're not having the same level of traffic accidents and heart attacks and so forth because they're not going to work. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a kind of funny situation here. And so they, they, the system is in, that system is under stress. Uh, more uh, foreclosures and evictions have been deferred to the end of the year. Watch out what happens in January if that doesn't happen, doesn't get extended. Um, and then once one gets over the, um, uh, so the, the pandemic, there's going to be a lot of debt write downs that are going to have to happen. If they don't happen, uh, then the encampments that you see all around uh, in the U.S. are just going to be mushrooming. I mean, people living under under highway. Uh, overpasses and so forth, which haven't seen very much of in like 30 or 40 years in, in, in here in Austin, but they're out there now. Uh, and, and lots of other places much, much worse than here. Uh, so those things are, are the real symptoms of precarity. But once one gets past that, it seems to me that the structure of employment that, that really, you know, it held every, it kept everything moving along for the last dozen years or so, isn't going to be there because you can't run 
restaurants and bars and cafes and gyms and all of these massage parlors and nail salons and everything that an American city sort of uses to keep people occupied. You can't run them uh, unless people are using them. Uh, and they're not going to be using them to nearly the same degree that they did before, partly because, first of all, until the health problem is there, these places are just hanging on by their fingernails. And partly because even after it's gone, people have to have incomes and savings and reasons to want to go out uh, if you were they start doing that again. And so you're just going to have tens of millions of people who are going to be far more precarious situations than they were before. What can you do? Well, I mean, it seems to me the logical thing to do is to think about how do we cooperativize a lot of these things, uh, at least so that so that the, the, the municipal government, uh, the, the state government, what have you, is supporting uh, the operation of, a, of, of, of an urban living system, an urban ecology in a way that doesn't require everybody to be constantly actually running a capacity in order to make enough money to stay in business. You do that, uh, and then you start restructuring life and the model that's more sustainable. Uh, so I, I see this as a lot of things which are actually not related to reindustrialization, which we don't need to, the world has, the Chinese are producing 115 million face masks a day as of the end of February. Oh, there's no reason why they can't, of course they are exporting them. They don't have a need for them at home because they don't have the virus. You know, so we should have some reserve capacity in these respects and, um, and, and maintain it, but that's not the, where the employment needs are, where the, where, the, where the problem of precarity in the society is. So, I mean, I could go on at length, but it seems one has to think about these things in terms of the structure of the economies that we actually have uh, and what people actually do. The labor force is not, you know, it's not the, it's not the miners and the loggers and the, and, the, and the auto workers of the 1930s. The labor force is, of course, it's heavily female, it's much younger, it's office workers and service workers. Uh, and there, that's where we need to, to pay attention. Oh, one other thing, federal system, you got to support all the local lower levels of government. Mm -hmm. You got to put money into states and 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 into municipalities so they can they can keep the water systems and the power systems and the mm -hmm. trash collection and everything else that they the public schools uh, open and running and that's a big big problem right now. Can can, can I just add something to this? Um, all of this, of course, makes sense, but it would not diminish um, the pressures on labor in terms of um, precarious employment and low wages, if we do not change the rules of the game in, in terms of globalization. Because if we expose to the existing pressures you know, pre uh, of, of global economic competition, the pressures on labor would remain. And so what we have a, a great chance now, and the European Commission came actually with a proposal for a new uh, trade agreement with the US uh, I have not uh, seen uh, this proposal, but I don't think that they have any uh, inclu anything or language on labor rights. So we need to very urgently, this I think it's a matter of priority of setting uh, or renegotiating globalization uh, through very high levels of, of labor and environmental protection. Uh, currently, the, the focus is on the digital transition uh, and stuff mm. like uh, agriculture but on labor. So unless we insulate our societies from these kind of nefarious pressures of, of, of global market competition, we won't be able to do all these forms at local and national level. Um, so that, that's what I believe. No, I agree with that as well. Um, I would also point can, out that- Can I, can I, can I just, maybe just ask, uh, there's Jaime still waiting in here to come in. Yep. Maybe if you just let him come in before, before we run out of time. Um, I mean, it's totally okay. I'm enjoying this debate very much. I can mm -hmm. take the questions for them if there's time, it's okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that was your oh. opportunity just to bring no, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't let us off the hook. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah. Just, just come in, please. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, sorry, so one of the solutions Alvina was proposing uh, to, to diminish or, or, or to start thinking of how to overcome precarity, generalized precarity, was uh, stabilizing people's lives and sort of a return to a sort of neo welfare state, or I'm not really sure if I understood that correctly. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid that if that happens, we will be again trapped in the in the paradox of wealth distribution and not really addressing 
uh, the issue systemically. So in what ways or what has to really happen in the case that we actually return to the social democratic state where you know there's redistribution and how is that going to prompt us to think further? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the short economist answer. You had to write down debts. You write down debts, you write down people's assets and the, the whole wealth structure changes. Uh, and then you have to restructure the financial system because they're the ones holding all the mortgages. That's where the that's where the the debt dependency and peonage comes from. Uh, and so I mean, and it's really problematic in the U.S. because half the ha rental housing units are held by mom and pop uh, people whose livings depend upon getting rent, and they have taxes to pay. So you you know that's why there's the strong incentive just to pump money into the system so everybody can keep the wheels turning. Uh, but I don't see how it lasts forever. Uh, or you can do that indefinitely as a, uh, you know, just without any, without any addressing the actual levels of things that the people are expected to be responsible for. So I just see this as a, as a massive imbroglio, but it really does affect the wealth structure that actually, you know, is what matters to millions of people. And now the, the other thing about, you know, the, the small numbers who actually have plutocratic levels of income and wealth, uh, they're largely in finance and technology. Uh, and the, the, to my mind, the way you deal with that is you, is you put very stiff estate taxes on those so that people can accumulate for, for their lifetimes and so what. Uh, and, but in 30 or 40 years, either they give it away or the government comes and take it, takes it. And that's a powerful incentive to give it away. And as someone who lives in a university uh, and is a recipient of such uh, benefits, I think that's an excellent system. <laughs> I mean, it's a whole class of us <laughs> for whom uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the evils of the, in Texas, the oil industry are, are mitigated by the fact that the that vast universities and health systems have been built by people whose generosity was motivated by the fact that if they weren't, the estate tax would come and grab it. Yeah, I, I, I would, to add to that, I, I thought that, I think that one of the factors that, that may distinguish this crisis from 2008 is that 2008 was the debtors that really got screwed. I mean, it, it, you effectively had governments giving creditors a hundred cents back on the dollar. There was no, there was no debt restructuring, and um, so uh, really, even though we recovered, um, there was still uh, growth was still profoundly uh, skewed. The benefits of growth were still profoundly skewed to the upper uh, echelons of society, and um, I don't think you can go back to that. My my guess is that this time around, it will be the creditors who will be really screwed. Um, it will be that will include the large holders of, uh, of financial assets, but it will also include a lot of creditor nations. I think countries like Germany are likely to be screwed in the European Union. Uh, maybe screwed is too strong a word because uh, I think the Italians and the Spanish and, the, and even the French have, have um, suffered from uh, um, you know, the rigors of austerity for too long. But I, so I, I think um, uh, that will happen. I, I think it's also possible that, um, that, that uh, it, it will impact on on, on China, um, you know, I think it's in the in the 1930s, everyone talks about how bad Smoot Hawley was. It, it, it was bad for the United States because the United States was the uh, the, the largest creditor in the world at that time. Um, and so, when they introduced um, tariffs, they actually were the ones that that you know it was a classic case of cutting off your nose to spite your face. So it's possible that that, that China does um, you know get get impacted. It's probably robust enough to withstand the problems. But I think that's a, 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 another area where you could do uh, look at things. Um, I, there's one other point I think that should be made because this conversation has been very US centric. And I think, um, and Albina and I have had discussed this before, but you know, the, the, um, the US is unique in the sense that many of aspects which, which give you a baseline to mitigate precarity in, in Europe are provided in the way of government um, public goods, government uh, funded public goods. So it, it, they, even though they, they have um, cut them back, the, the European social welfare states typically tend to be much more generous than the United States. Um, so for example, in the US, we, we pay for healthcare as largely a condition of employment. Uh, and um, um, so you get this invidious situation during the pandemic where you shut down to mitigate the public, uh, uh, to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. People get laid off, they lose their access to the healthcare, and they and 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 this becomes a vicious cycle. So I think that's a problem that um, is less ac acute in Europe because there is still universal healthcare. But I do believe um, that the U.S. does have to um, uh, restructure its its healthcare system. 
Um, Jamie once suggested that you might want to uh, bring Medicare, uh, reduce the level of, Medi uh, of, of um, uh, Medicare down to, uh, uh, and social, social Security rather down to 60 or 55. Uh, maybe that's also another, another thing you do. You probably also have to, um, there were, probably will be more leisure, so you have to uh, consider ways of sharing work uh, more equitably. Um, these are not new ideas. I think there was um, a Polish sociologist in the 1960s who, produced, who, who advocated a six plus six plus six program. Um, and uh, of course, uh, employers don't like that, but that's the kind of the, another type of thing I, I think that needs to be done um, so that we can, and, and of course, above all else, we'd like to see uh, what Keynes described as the youth in Asia of the Rentier uh, and, as, as we go forward as well. Um, uh, so that increased leisure is combined with less uh, rentier generated economy for a few oligarchs at the top. Albina, do you want to um, conclude? Uh, I think it, it, it showed that how much more we, we can add, uh, because the devil's is in the detail, you have to square, square the circle with all these policies uh, to, to secure um, our lives. Uh, so that would be my conclusion that let's let's continue talking about that. And I shall agree to that and we should definitely continue the conversation and hopefully sometime in here in Cambridge. So thank you a lot for for coming virtually today and I hope next time we'll, we'll we can actually have a time to enjoy also Cambridge and have, have a real discussion over a few days. Okay, so thank I you. take a break. <laughs> Good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.